Good evening, everyone that's here tonight. Um, glad you could all be here. I'm Dr. Mark McFarlane. Obviously, we usually do these uh, lectures in our office, but uh, thanks to this viral pandemic um, and the, we're doing things a little differently online, obviously the technology is allowing us to all come together and uh, provide you with this information safely. Um, many patients have asked how we're able to keep our patients safe in the office. Of course, one of the main things is we're adhering to CDC guidelines, wearing masks, social distancing. We're cleaning the areas frequently, especially the high traffic areas where patients may congregate. Uh, we've added a lot of different precautions, in, including in-person appointments. Uh, we, you can check in with an app. You can wait in the car. You're taken directly to the uh, room so you can see your physician that you're seeing that day. Our employees, we check our employees every day uh, to make sure that we're aware of any possible uh, infection that you may get from us. Uh, besides them wearing masks, we're checking our, our patients' temperatures and looking for any signs and symptoms they may have for our employees. Uh, we also offer um, virtual appointments through um, telephone or through audio health for you. If, uh, if your insurance allows that, we're glad to do that for you. Um, we're about to start into the lecture now. I want to remind everybody as well uh, that there's a question and answer box on your screen. So if you would like to ask a question, you can do that at any time. You can input your question and we'll try to get that answered for you during the course of our lecture. Topic tonight is a less exposure spine surgery. Uh, and that basically is what it implies. How do we perform spine surgery uh, with exposing less of the spinal anatomy and trying to avoid uh, the typical complications uh, of a more maximally invasive procedure. A lot of people are concerned about spine surgery. They've had relatives that have had surgery uh, and haven't had great outcomes. A lot of those things are changing, especially with advances uh, in technology and our, and our ability to be less invasive to you. Again, the question and answer box, uh, you can see on this screen, um, uh, ask your question and we'll try to get that answered for you. A little review of the spinal anatomy. The majority of patients I see are having problems either with the pink picture, that's the cervical spine, or the purple that you see there, that's the lumbar spine. These are the mobile segments of the spine. Anytime there's motion, you can create arthritis and have problems, just like you do with the knee that you move very often or your hip or your shoulder. Areas that are mobile wear out. We are very mechanical. Um, some of the common problems that we see, obviously, are general back pain, uh, herniated discs in the spine where the nerves are compressed, the condition called spinal stenosis. That just means compression around the spinal canal. Um, sacroiliitis, that's a joint in your pelvis that can become inflamed or arthritic. Uh, and spondylolisthesis, that's a long term. Uh, some people just simply call it a slip. It's an area where the spine has become very arthritic and unstable. And that compresses the nerves, giving the patients a lot of back pain and leg pain as well. A lot of people think that back pain is just from improper lifting, but that is the least common thing that I see. Most conditions are degenerative and occur after years and years of repetitive activity that lead to arthritis in the spine. Uh, this picture represents spinal stenosis. So if you look at that, you'll see a canal in the middle of the spine. And at one segment, you'll see this large mound that's compressing that canal down. That's what spinal stenosis is. It's simply a narrowing of the spinal canal. When the spine is narrowed, it becomes inflamed. It doesn't like that. You get symptoms. That is in the form of pain, numbness, tingling, perceived weakness, either in your arms or your legs. There are a lot of different uh, neurologic sequela of having that compression on the spine. You may get a burning sensation. A lot of patients will come in to me and say they feel like there are bugs crawling on their skin or water dripping you know, down their legs. These are all neurologic symptoms that you can get uh, just from the nerves trying to tell your brain that something's going on. We'll, we'll typically send patients for conservative treatment. You know, We're talking about surgical techniques here, but there are a lot of things that we do 
that aren't surgical. And I want everyone to be very aware that the majority of patients we see are never going to see the inside of a surgical suite. 95% of patients that come to see us won't need surgery. And typically these conditions can be treated with simple physical therapy, possibly some oral steroids or injected steroids called epidurals around the spine. Uh, sometimes we do need to consider surgery and, and surgery has shown that there are better long-term outcomes when a patient has surgery to decompress the spine than for those who don't go surgery, uh, surgical route and, and, and tolerate the issues. This is an example of a type of procedure to decompress the spinal nerves. If you, if you see there, the yellow represents the spinal canal and the neurologic structures that have been simply unroofed with what's called a laminectomy. Uh, and that procedure is simply to open the door on the nerves, to take the pressure off the nerves. Spinal epidurals, what are we doing with those? We're simply injecting medications around the spinal nerves, whether it's in your neck, that's called a cervical epidural, or around your lower back. Um, we can do those types of things. These are more of a pain management approach. If you look at it, uh, injections like epidurals, are they always meant to completely fix the problem? Uh, and the answer is no. I mean, we're not trying to completely get rid of the issue with these injections. We're really trying to mask the problem somewhat. And a lot of times your body will adapt to the issue, become acclimatized, so to speak, to the issue, and you'll be asymptomatic. You may be asymptomatic for years and years before it becomes an issue again. It may not become an issue again. So for a lot of patients, it's well worthwhile to try the injections to see how beneficial they are. If they're not beneficial, obviously you can talk about surgical ways to remedy the problem. If they are beneficial, that may, may be your answer and help you avoid surgery. <clears throat> This is an example of a spinal epidural. Uh, you'll see the needle in place and the dark line is where dye has been injected around the nerve. And that dark, that line represents the nerve coming out of the spine. And then the medicine will be injected around that nerve to try to quiet it. And that works very well. 60, 70% of patients do extremely well with spinal epidurals. Uh, this is the condition we talked about, a spondylolisthesis. And I'm gonna show you a couple pictures. I'm gonna fast forward here a little bit. This picture is just so everyone can be reminded that this is not a condition of old people or where your spine is worn out. Young people can have a spondylolisthesis as well. It's common in dancers. That's why you saw that picture there. Um, anything that compresses the nerves can be an issue for you. And, and in the bottom picture, you'll see where a portion of the disc has come out of place and is sitting up against one of the nerves. And the red in the picture there just represents where the nerve is inflamed and irritated. Obviously that's gonna give the patient neurologic, neurologic symptoms, whether it's numbness, tingling, or weakness. That's what we're typically gonna be trying to treat with some of our surgical conditions or with our spinal epidurals. This picture represents that spondylolisthesis. This is a slip. So if you look at those bones, L means lumbar. This is the lumbar four on top of the lumbar five. You can see how the bones have come out of position, meaning they don't line up with each other. The L4 bone is, sit is sitting significantly anterior to where it should be sitting um, on the other bone. And what that does is it severely compresses the nerves It'll give you back pain, it'll give you leg pain, it can give you weakness, it can give you what's called a foot drop as well, where your foot doesn't actually function normally. How do we treat it? It depends on your symptoms. If, if the slip is mild, you may respond well to simple medicines, some physical therapy, maybe a spinal epidural, maybe some of our pain management approaches. If the problem gets very severe, it has to be surgically fixed. Uh, in, in previous years, that, that correction would be a fairly maximally invasive procedure to expose the spinal anatomy, realign the spine, and fuse it. Now we can do the same procedure through these less exposure techniques, typically through an incision that's less than two inches in length to actually stabilize a slip like that. 
So what we'll do is, is we'll place instruments into the spine. These are called pedicle screws that we position and we put bone graft around the spine to help the spine to become solid uh, in those places that you've developed some instability. A lot of times we'll place spacers between the bones. This is called an inner body spacer. You'll see the inner body cage placed between the two bones to help the, the spine fuse uh, better. This is a, a typical picture of a spinal fusion. So you, if you'll notice there, there are actually six screws in the spine. There are two rods, one on each side of the spine. How would we do it if we were gonna do it in more of a less invasive fashion? So think about it if you could have a, a procedure to fix your back that had very little blood loss, had less operative time in general, where you weren't in surgery for nearly as long as you typically would have been, um, and the outcomes were better than previous years, and the instrumentation was actually stronger. Well, that's what we're able to offer now. Um, these techniques are developed over time. It's not something that you can simply go out and ask any physician for. Um, it, I would say that it takes hundreds of cases to develop the skills needed to perform these less exposure surgeries accurately and effectively without complication. And I've been uh, performing the LAS procedure approach since 2013. Uh, and uh, at this point, after eight, going on, this is my seventh year doing that, I can report we've had zero infections with any lumbar fusions in seven years. I've had to give zero transfusions of any blood in the last seven years. And I've had to uh, return to surgery only one time for a patient that did not fuse a level. And that was because he fell and had a trauma in the post-surgical period. Uh, so. Uh, that just lets you know how less invasive these procedures are than what we saw in the past. It's it's a fairly exciting time to be able to to do these types of of surgery and and help patients without some of the complications we saw in previous years. We can do some of the same things in the cervical spine. This is a picture of a of a cervical spine fusion. If you look at this, this is called a microplate, uh, and you may look at that and think that looks large, but that plate is only two millimeters uh, uh, thick from the anterior to the posterior portion, and then it's only about uh, 10 millimeters tall. So this is a very, very small device that can be put in through a, only a one inch incision uh, to do surgery on someone's cervical spine. This is a, a, a image of a two level spinal fusion. You'll see these little spacers that go between the bones that hold the spine in alignment and allow the spine to fuse together. Uh, another exciting thing that we're doing to uh, enhance the fusions is we're using a, a chemical called hydroxyapatite. Um, what it does, it's a natural occurring compound, but it enhances the speed of bone growth. So we're, we're placing that inside of a lot of our implants that we're using, and that may take someone that may normally take up to six months to, to fuse, well, maybe they'll fuse in three months now. So if, if you can heal in half the time, obviously that's what you wanna do. Another big part of why people don't like spine surgery is because of the time it takes to heal. If you go have your gallbladder removed in two weeks, you're completely healed up and you're ready to go. But a spinal fusion is more like um, being in the times of the coronavirus. It seems like it takes forever. You know, It doesn't go away and it takes a long time to heal, but now we're able to see much quicker healing times using products like this hydroxyapatite. <clears throat> Those, that picture I showed you earlier of the, the inner body cage, that's a little device. Again, I'm gonna show you what that is. This is a picture of a device I developed with another company a few years back. What it allows us to do is to place this structure between the bones when the cushions between the bones have collapsed. So say the cushions have completely collapsed and the bones are pretty much sitting bone on bone in your spine. I can place this little device through an opening about the size of a pencil eraser and lift the spine all the way back up to its normal height. 
So that allows you to be very minimally invasive in order to lift the spine back up and, and restore your normal height at these levels. And we all know that we lose height over time. The main reason we lose height as we get older is because we're losing the height of the cushions between the bones. It's not that the bone is actually shrinking, it's that the spaces between the bones are shrinking because we're starting to wear them out. And this allows me to restore them uh, very quickly and very, in a very less exposure fashion. This is an example of putting one of those little devices in through a small tube. We can make a, a one inch incision and be able to make an opening into the spine and place that little device. One of the other exciting things that we're doing, if you look at these, these pictures of screws, you'll notice that one of the pictures on the left side shows implants that are very close to the midline and the screws will go from a medial to a lateral trajectory. They, they're pointing out on the spine. The other screws are placed very far outside off the midline and come in. That's the typical way we used to do pedicle screws years ago. And when, when, when we had to place them so far out laterally on the spine, we had to surgically expose all of that anatomy. We had to take away any muscle or ligament or tissue that was blocking that path so that we could place those screws in. And if you see the difference in the screws on the left, you'll see with the midline approach, we don't have to expose much of your anatomy at all. We don't have to remove much of the muscle tissue at all. We don't have to destroy or cause bleeding around any of that tissue at all, which allows you to heal up much more quickly than you were able to, to heal before. But better than that, better than it being less invasive to you, we found that those screws, if they're placed appropriately, are actually about 37% stronger than the traditional screws. They're stronger at, for with, with uh, being pulled out of the bone or loosening over time. And I virtually see none of these screws ever loosen, especially if they're supported with one of those little inner body spaces, spacers that I showed you uh, that goes between the bones to replace the cushions. So again, you'll see 37% greater pullout strength compared to our traditional screws. So again, they're placed in a way that is easier for you and they're stronger than the traditional screws. There's less blood loss, there's faster recovery. Um, this is just a picture representing a type of biologic. And what that means is we're, when we do these procedures to fuse the spine, we're trying to get the bone to grow together and we can either use your bone, which means that maybe we'll make an incision and take bone from your pelvis, or we can use artificial bone. And 20 or 30 years ago, some of that artificial bone was not as effective as your own bone. That's why we would harvest yours. Now we're finding many products that are as effective as your own bone. So we don't have to make those additional incisions. We don't have to traumatize your pelvis to go in Remember, if you have any questions whatsoever, just type those in and we'll try to get those to you. Stuck again. So next topic, we're going to be talking about a herniated disc. And that's one of the most common problems that we'll see in the spine. The cushion between the bone over time will become unloaded with stress. It'll become degenerated. 
and part of that disc will push out of its place and will compress the nerves. Obviously, this will create can create back pain, neck pain. It can create uh, shooting, burning pain in your arm or your leg. Um, it's, this disc is made of a dense connective tissue. It's not bone. It's simple connective tissue. Um, there are a lot of things that can cause it, but once you get it, and this is an example of that, you'll see the, the purple represents the inside of the disc, and it represents a place where it is torn and pushed outside of the natural disc, and it's up against the nerve. The nerve represents the yellow structure that you see here. Obviously, that's going to uh, create quite a bit of pain in the areas where that nerve goes, whether it goes to the skin, it goes to the muscle, you'll feel symptoms in those areas or weakness in those areas. Uh, this again, you'll see the, uh, the arrow pointing to a herniated disc. Uh, the central stu structure there is the area where the spinal nerves are at. So these discs can place very, very significant pressure on the nerves creating pain. If they're in areas of your spine where your spinal cord is, they can create a pseudo paralysis or create a true paralysis situation um, that has to be uh, corrected emergently. Where they're diagnosed with an MRI, we obviously we can't see a disc herniation on a regular X-ray. An X-ray just shows us bone primarily. Uh, at times, we'll use medications. We'll try physical therapy. We may try a spinal epidural. Uh, a lot of times these herniations require surgery. Uh, and nowadays we can perform that in a very less exposure fashion. And, and the primary procedure for that is called a microdiscectomy. So we'll use some type of magnification, whether that's a set of glasses that, that I would wear surgically or a type of microscope in this situation where we can make a very, very small incision and potentially perform the procedure utilizing small tubular retractors or other types of small retractors that gain us access to those nerves. With that procedure, we're simply trying to take the herniated disc, that abnormal tissue, off the nerve so that the nerve does not have any pressure on it any longer. Your symptoms almost immediately go away with that procedure. It takes about 30 minutes to perform that surgery. It's done as an outpatient procedure, and usually after about a month, uh, you're 100% healed up and could uh, really function normally. This is an example of that tube that we'll utilize through a one-inch incision uh, to go down and remove that portion of the disc that's come out of place. It's another picture just representing the small tools that we may use uh, to remove that disc. Motion preservation. Um, that's a pretty hot topic in the spine world. A lot of these procedures that we've talked about, you've noticed we've talked about fusions. We're, we're trying to treat the anatomy, but then we're stabilizing the spine and causing the, the spinal segments to grow together. Well, a lot of patients will say, well, I don't want a fusion. What can I do otherwise? Well, there are other options in situations where we can actually do a disc replacement. So think about it this way. If you have an uh, arthritic knee and the doctor told you, well, I can either fuse your knee together where your knee doesn't ever bend or move anymore, or I can perform a knee replacement where your bent knee bends completely normally, which one would you rather have? And most people I would say would probably pick to have a knee replacement rather than fuse their knee. Well, that's what we're looking at here in the spine world as well. We have a way to actually fix the problem but maintain all of your motion at that segment, whether it's from the cervical spine or the lumbar spine. These procedures have been shown to be equally as, as effective as a spinal fusion at treating your, your issue. One of the problems that we've had in the past is a lot of insurance companies have not approved disc replacements, and that includes Medicare, um, so they're typically done for our patients from the, let's say, the 20 to 60 year old age group. Um, this is an example of a spinal fusion, again, where multiple segments of the spine were grown together with bone. This is an example of a disc replacement. Now, if you look at that, you'll see that it looks like a, a ball and cup. It's mobile because it's simply a metal on metal structure that rolls and bends and moves with the spinal anatomy. This is an example of that device implanted in the neck. 
So this patient had a herniation, the disc was removed, and instead of fusing the two bones together, this implant was placed that allowed that portion of the spine to continue to articulate normally um, forever. And in rare situations, these segments of the spine will fuse together. It's not as common with this implant, how it was designed. Um, but the results, as I've stated, in, in some recent studies, the re results have actually been shown to be superior. And this is again motion that's showing the neck flexing forward. This is an example of a disc replacement in the lumbar spine where we've actually replaced the very bottom disc, the L5-S1 disc. Uh, this was a, a type of disc called the Depuy-Charte uh, disc. Um, this is a picture of the disc actually implanted so you can see what it's made of. It's, it's actually metal surfaces and a type of polyethylene which is, some people would say that's a type of plastic, but it's sitting between the two metal surfaces. It's kind of what we see exactly with knee replacement. So it's a very similar, similar type of product. Uh, sacroiliac disease. When we talk about that, that is a joint that is between your spine and your pelvis. And you have one on each side. They're just above your hip joints. So a lot of patients will come into me and say, well, I have hip pain and they're actually pointing to their sacroiliac joints. And it can be a true problem with those joints or it can be something that's referred from your spine down over that area. So a big part of what we do is trying to, to figure out exactly where your pain is coming from. These joints are critical for transferring load when you're walking, when you're moving. And they can become very arthritic over time. They can become a little unstable and start to give you pain. We have... Um, a question that I'll answer in just a second for you after I finish this, this section. Um, this uh, picture in red represents the sacroiliac joint. You can see where it's fairly red and fairly inflamed. Uh, we see it a lot in pregnant patients. We see it a lot in runners, uh, long distance runners as well. We'll treat it conservatively with rest, with anti-inflammatories, with physical therapy, and we'll treat it with injections at times those are not effective and we have to be more aggressive especially if the joint is extremely arthritic and and i see that more in either women that have had multiple children so the joints over time have just become very arthritic from that or they've had multiple spinal fusions and the joints have become arthritic below the spinal fusion and in that situation you can perform this type of less exposure surgery. This is a sacroiliac joint fusion where these, these small pegs are placed across the joint to allow the joint to grow together where it will not give pain anymore. And that can be fairly effective if done in the right patient and done appropriately. Um, so one question we had today is that, that a patient's MRI showed facet joint arthritis uh, and the, these were creating severe compression over the nerves in the cervical spine. So we're talking about the neck. Uh, at several levels, it appears, there was no spinal canal stenosis, meaning that the spinal cord itself is not being compressed, just that the nerves in the foramen on the left were being compressed. Um, the question is, is it going to get worse if I continue to ride horses? The the problem for you there is the pressure on the nerve exiting the spine is already severe. And the natural progression of degeneration is for things to become worse and worse over time, not better. So at this point, with it already being severe, any mechanical thing you do, whether it's riding horses or just living your life, is going to slowly create more problems. But it's a slow progression. So I would tell you, you live your life, you, you do exactly what you want to do. And knowing that the problem you have in your neck is already fairly significant over that nerve on the left, at some point you may either have to have spinal epidurals to treat that or you're going to have to have surgery to treat it. But it's safe simply because it's not compressing your spinal cord. You don't have any canal stenosis. So you don't have to worry about anything that's going to paralyze you if you fell off the horse or had damage in that regard. So I would say you live your life, you have fun. If you're having a lot of symptoms in the left arm, you, you have an injection to treat it, 
if the injections don't work well, the problem that you have can be easily surgically fixed, so you don't have to worry about those those problems, and you can continue to ride horses after surgery as well. So the next um, topic is a kyphoplasty. Um, that's becoming uh, very popular. I have a lot of patients coming in to see me about this issue all the time. A kyphoplasty is a treatment that we do for spinal fractures. You may have heard of a compression fracture. So as you age, your bone will get softer, obviously. That's osteoporosis. And simple falls, and sometimes you don't even have to fall, and you'll compress one of the bones in the back. That can be treated with a simple procedure where we are actually lifting the bone back up with a balloon and placing cement inside the bone to fix it. And virtually 50% of your pain is gone as soon as we do it, and within a few weeks, the rest of it's completely gone and that bone is stable. And we used to have to do that in the hospital, and now we're able to do it with a 15 minute procedure here in the office, just using local anesthetics. It's pretty amazing. So you, you don't have to be concerned about going and laying under um, general anesthesia. Most of the things that become risky with spinal surgery aren't related to the spinal surgery themselves. They're related to the anesthesia. They're related to having to go to sleep and having multiple other medical conditions, whether it's your heart or your lungs or your diabetes or something else that's affected um, by the surgical procedure and the anesthesia. So um, I've been doing these now for about seven years. We, we do probably a hundred a year here at the uh, Orthopedic and Spine Center. And you see there 20 to 30 minutes, that time has come down significantly where most of the cases will take me 15 minutes to perform and correct that fracture now. This is an example of one of those broken vertebrae. You see the uh, the bone is wedged down and you can see the fracture lines uh, in the bone. We'll diagnose this on x-rays, but also with an MRI. Uh, a very, after we numb the skin and the muscle, a very fine needle is placed into the bone. After we place that, we'll put a tiny balloon through that opening and we'll slowly lift that balloon up to try to restore the height of the vertebrae. Once the vertebrae, the bone is back to its height or as high as we can get it, we'll remove the balloon and fill the cavity we've created with bone cement. So that's the same type of cement you may have had with a knee replacement or a hip replacements in the past um, to stabilize the bone. Just if you had a broken arm, we'd put a cast on your arm, but we can't put a cast around one of these broken bones. So this is like we put a cast inside the bone, if that makes sense. We do that utilizing a special x-ray machine that we use in the office. It's just, just a picture to represent that, that uh, device that we'll use so we can see live pictures. Um, there's no guessing when it comes to this type of procedure. We're able to see your anatomy at all times. Some new things that we're doing that uh, are obviously much less exposure is some of our stem cell transplantation procedures. So with these procedures, we're actually harvesting the bone marrow and concentrating the stem cells and injecting those back into your damaged tissue, whether it's an arthritic knee or hip or a degenerative disc in your back. Um, and we're able to get success rates uh, somewhere between 50 and I'll say 80%, the average about 70% for the conditions we treat um, to successfully help restore that tissue where you don't have to have surgery. And, and the end game for most people is I'm trying to prevent surgery. You know, what can I do to, to stay away from a surgical procedure? And at times stem cells allow patients to do that. Um, we, I perform a lot of them for disc problems. If you have a torn disc or a bulging disc, the stem cells can, can help to restore some of your spinal anatomy so you don't require surgery. Uh, that procedure literally takes me anywhere from five to, to 20 minutes to perform depending on what we need to do for your anatomy. So at times it's, it's something we have to sit down and talk and see if your condition could be treated with stem cells. Uh, the one problem that we have in the United States is that no insurance in the United States covers stem cell therapy. Uh, it's considered experimental and why? And that's because it's expensive. And you're treating conditions a lot of times that are mild to moderate. They're progressive conditions, 
but insurance companies don't want to treat those conditions. They want to treat an issue that's severe, something that has to go to surgery. Otherwise, they won't, they won't cover it. So they typically will not cover these uh, procedures, and I don't expect them to cover them in the near future. Um, so, you know, what we're getting down to here with some of these problems in the spine is you can have arthritis that creates bone spurs. You can have disc problems that compress the nerves. Um, you can have osteoporosis that allows the bone to fracture. There are a lot of things that can cause pain in the spine, back pain, nerve pain. There are a lot of different options for treating those and they can be anywhere from something that's extremely aggressive and invasive to ways to treat the spine now that are very, very minimally invasive. In a lot of ways don't even require surgery at all, whether it's stem cells or in-office kyphoplasty procedures where you're wide awake when we're doing it to procedures that require an inch like a microdiscectomy to maybe two inches for a less invasive spinal fusion nowadays. So these procedures have been developed where you don't have to be as concerned anymore about the invasiveness of a spine surgery. Spine surgery actually is much less invasive than knee replacements and hip replacements that people commonly perform every day without concerns. Um, if you feel like you want to consider these type of procedures, ask your surgeon. You know, you're wanting to find a surgeon that has very significant experience and expertise in these conditions, these, these procedures. These procedures are not taught um, in residencies or fellowships typically. Um, in those situations, you're, the surgeons are doing more maximally invasive procedures. And some of these techniques are things that the surgeons have to learn over time, be trained on, and develop their own experience and expertise. And you're not going to develop that over one to 10 cases. That's where you're usually going to see a lot of complications. So you never want to be the first patient to undergo any type of new procedure. You want to make sure that your surgeon is ex ex very experienced in this. And if so, you'll reap the benefits of, uh, of, of these techniques. Again, we have um, a big question and answer box down there. I've got a few more questions to answer for you, but if you have something, go ahead and uh, start typing it in for us now. So one question is, if I need surgery, where would we be taking you to surgery? I'll, I'll, here at uh, the Orthopedic and Spine Center, a lot of our procedures go to Mary Immaculate Hospital. Most of those procedures are outpatient procedures, so you'd come into the surgical pavilion and get to go home the same day. Uh, we also have a um, outpatient surgical center that we are opening here in Newport News. Some of you may be aware of that, um, um, Coastal Virginia Surgical Center. It's right beside our office. Uh, and um, as, as we start going here and more and more insurances uh, jump on board, we're gonna be taking a lot of our procedures there. So. Um, be, it's a beautiful new facility. I think most patients are, are really going to be excited to be able to have their procedures there. Next question, if I wanted to start with an epidural, uh, would that take place in a hospital? You, you, you could have it done in the hospital setting if you really wanted to, meaning that there is one physician in the area that will do the procedures under sedation if you are extremely anxious or concerned. Nowadays, these injections, these epidurals are so easy to do. We do them right here in the office. You'll, you'll have a little bit of local anesthesia, just like you went to the dentist, and you'll have the injection. And, and literally, we do 3,000 of these spinal epidurals a year here in our office without issue. So it, it's very safe, very effective, um, and you don't have to waste the time going to the hospital, having an IV. If you go to the hospital, it's probably going to take you literally two hours, maybe three hours of your day to have that injection, where if you come here, you'll be in and out in 15 minutes with the procedure. Next question, I enjoyed spending time with my grandchildren. If I were to have a less exposure surgery, how long until I can get back to chasing them around? Okay, so and that's a fantastic question because that's the key. I mean, everyone wants to have their procedure and heal up quickly, just like we were talking about if you had your gallbladder removed or something like that. Well, now with these procedures, I would say we've cut your time in half. The, the minimally invasive approach 
the different types of biologics, the hydroxy appetite, the different screw formation, you know, you would be able to be functioning fairly normally at six weeks. And hopefully by three months, most of your healing is completely done with these procedures now. So um, you're definitely not looking at the six to 12 month window of you know, prolonged healing like we used to see. Next question, is there any downtime with stem cell therapy? I usually uh, set patients up for a, a period of about six weeks where after the procedure, you're not doing a lot of bending, twisting or lifting of the affected body part, whether it's your back, your knee, your hip, your shoulder, may have you wear a brace just like you had surgery on some of those areas. And we really try to shut you down to give the regenerative therapy process time to start to work. After six weeks, I let you pretty much do what you're comfortable doing. Um, last question, how long would it take me to get an appointment with you? Uh, if you call in the majority of the time, if you request, we're able to get you a next uh, day appointment, meaning that the, the next time I'm in the office, if you call in specifically to ask for Dr. McFarland, if I'm in surgery, they may put you in to see me the next day. Uh, we usually can find an opportunity for you to be seen that next day. If not, rarely would you be more than a week for it to, us to take uh, to get you in unless one of us are on vacation or something weird this time of year. Um, we're always glad to try to get you in quickly. Uh, I don't have any more questions, so I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. If there are any, any questions at all that we haven't answered, um, just send in your question. You can call our office at 757-596-1900. Uh, you can request an appointment um, uh, through that phone line. Just put option five or go to www.osc-ortho.com. I think you can see both of those, 596-1900. Uh, be glad to see you at any time to review your spine, especially if another physician has evaluated you, if another physician has already told you you require surgery. Uh, I'd be glad to look at your studies for you, give, it, give you a second opinion on, on if we were going to do the procedure, how would that be done? You know, what, what are the differences that we're talking about? Um, so um, please, you know, if, if you want to, uh, um, to have an appointment, just give us a call. We'd be glad to get you in.